Good morning. Happy Sabbath. You know, we thought we'd do something before we get into the uh, content for today's message. Pastor Ross and I have been gone for a couple of weeks. We thought we owed you an explanation, and you might enjoy finding out what we were doing. And uh, it's really uh, had an exciting uh, experience going to the Southern Hemisphere. That's right, Pastor Doug. We were in Australia. Actually, we were in two cities in Australia, Melbourne, Brisbane. We might even have some pictures to show you. Part of the work in Australia was helping to organize Amazing Facts Oceana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got a map up there. Oceana covers oh, about a um, fifth of the world's surface. Not that many people, but it's a big territory of Australia, New Zealand, Micronesia, Polynesia. And um, just before COVID, Karen and I were there. We were trying to get things organized to set up the board. And during COVID, we managed to uh, get incorporated. And, and so Pastor Ross and I were going to go to meet with the board there, get things launched. We thought, we're going all that way. It's a long way. See if they had a speaking opportunity. And it turns out, they said, well, that'll line up perfectly with our, our AYC, which is the Australian Youth Conference. And let's do some AFCO training. We'll launch uh, an AFCO program. And it just continued to grow. So uh, that's Pastor Ross came, I think, one day before me, and he was teaching our AFCO students. That's right. We have a very first AFCO class in Australia. It's a three-month training program. And we had the students there. We were meeting in a local church, just a great group Thank doing you. Bible training, and you can see that group. In addition to that, though, as Pastor Doug mentioned, we also go. had what's called AYC, and that's our AFCO students, but the next picture will show you AYC. AYC is, as said, the equivalent of GYC in Australia. They had a special weekend event. Pastor Doug was the keynote speaker. The turnout was really inspiring. A lot of young people that came out to this event. Yeah, they, they met in, and that's, if you can go to the next picture now. We don't have a remote, so I told the guys in the studio, I'll like pull my ear, but I keep forgetting. The, uh, yeah, this was in the St. Kilda Town Hall and they had uh, hundreds of people that came out. We were very excited for the program. Next picture. And uh, during each presentation, this is largely young people. We were making appeals not only for commitments to Christ and baptism, but a lot of them were Christians, asking how many of them would be willing to dedicate a year of their lives in ministry, mission service of some form. And I think we had 60 young people that came forward to commit a year of their lives into uh, service. I think we have the next slide. We'll tell you a little, show you a little bit more. We met some wonderful people and heard some really inspiring testimonies. And I think some of you know, of course, Amazing Facts is an international ministry, and we do a lot of work translating our content into Chinese. Well, there was the Chinese lady that you see there, a very nice couple, a very influential, well-off. Um, she was on the internet, and she saw a pop-up ad on YouTube advertising the Amazing Facts program in, in Mandarin. And she saw MIQ, this a couple times. The MIQ, MIQ program. Yeah, the yeah. MIQ. Really good for youth. But she clicked on that, and she started watching this, and she was amazed at what she heard. And her husband became a little worried because she said she, she couldn't go to sleep at night without watching the next episode of the MIQ series. And so he began wondering about this, and she said to him, well, you've got to watch this too. Well, he tuned in, and he also began to watch the Amazing Facts programming, and finally they came to a point where they needed to respond to the messages, and they walked into a Seventh-day Adventist church and said, we're ready to join. We've been watching MIQ. So that's just one couple of, of several stories oh, yeah. of we people whose lives have changed. Heard a lot of amazing testimonies. Next pictures, yeah. This was still part of the uh, AYC program there. Next picture. And some of you may remember the Milsons. So they helped us in organizing. Ron is part of our board there, and uh, Katrina and Jamie. And uh, when we finished our work there in Melbourne, we flew up to where the Milsons now live in Brisbane. And it was a Tuesday night, and I told uh, Ron, I said, do you think we could organize a meeting on a Tuesday night? Would anybody come? And they rented an evangelical church there called the IC Center that seats over 1,000 people, and it was full. There was like 1,200 people that came out on a Tuesday night, and it was just a great opportunity to tell about now amazing facts in Oceana. You know, it went from one meeting in Melbourne, and we thought, wow, the turnout here is great. Then we went up to Brisbane, and we thought, 
Well, surely it's not going to be that good on a Tuesday evening. Well, we had a great turnout. And then we went to one other event there in the Brisbane area, and this was geared for young people. And this was really inspiring. You see the picture there? This is one of the churches, and Pastor Doug spoke at the, um, the Mount uh, Gravit Adventist Church, geared for young people. And what a tremendous meeting. They had never seen their church that full. There was yeah. overflow, people sitting on the side. There were hundreds sitting on the wings in overflow. That's in right. Addition to that. it was they so, said they'd never seen this before. Yeah. So that was really inspiring, just a great uh, program that we had there. And then we packed up our bags and we headed to our last stop, which was in Auckland, New Zealand. And Pastor Doug, kind of a miracle how this worked. Uh, while we were there in Australia, we got a report of some incredible rain and flooding that had occurred in Auckland. Yeah, just this is actually week before. a picture. They had record rains in Auckland. The airport was closed. The streets were washing out. Uh, many lost power. And just before we got there, they were telling people, stay home, don't travel. And we thought, great, well, you know, the church has rented a, a small stadium for our meetings. Now, will anybody come? And we were really praying. There was a group that got on the phone and they, six to 6.30, they prayed every day that the Lord would bless these meetings. And uh, Friday night when, you know, an evangelist is real nervous before a meeting, is anyone gonna show? Friday night, uh, you can go to the next picture there. Um, the, the stadium, this is actually Sabbath morning, but there were about over a thousand Friday night. Well, actually more okay. than that. The, the, this facility seats 2,500. It was almost at capacity, very close to that on Friday evening and we had 2,700 people show up on Sabbath morning, so they had overflow. That's the next picture, I think. Now, just the amazing part of the story here, that's the stadium you can see. Um, by God's providence, he worked this out because we were actually originally scheduled to do the Auckland meeting the week of the floods, the weekend of the floods. We had set up our schedule. They contacted us and said, you know, that weekend's probably not the best. This is long before the floods. Could we switch it to the next weekend? And we were like, okay, we'll go ahead and do that. Well, now we look back and say, sure enough, that was God's hands because our meeting would have had to have been canceled mm -hmm. if it would have been the original weekend. So we just see God's dealing in this and what a tremendous outcome, not only on Sabbath morning, but we did meetings in the afternoon. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we had, uh, I think Pastor Austin and I did questions and answers live, shared the testimony. We had a great time with the audience there and they all send their love here. By the way, people there come up and they said, uh, your pastors at the Grand Abbey Hilltop Church are our associate pastors. Because a lot of churches in that country, one pastor's got three or four churches, and when their regular pastor isn't there, they say, they just go to the Hilltop Church, and they watch the services. So they say, we know you, but you don't know us. But, but so, and we have a lot of online members there. So they send you their love. We thought we ought to give you a little mission report on just what's happening in that corner of the world and pray for them there in Oceana. Amen. Amen. Just one last thing. The folks see you on television and they kind of connect with you. We had Brad Heisler that was with us That's there, right. and people came up to Brad in New Zealand as if they knew Brad because they had seen Brad involved in the music up here on the stage. <laughs> so people are watching, they feel like Granite Bay is part of their church family. So the work that's happening doesn't just happen here, but all of you are part of the family that many people tune in week after week, and they've been blessed and encouraged as they hear the Word of God. So just a very encouraging Amen. report. Amen. Thank you so much. I think, I think that was the last picture. Is that right? We'll find out if it goes to black. All right. Uh-huh, next picture, just checking. Advance. We're going to go to a sermon. There we go. Okay. Well, how much time do I have? It says zero. I'm out of time <laughs> on the clock. Good morning. We're going to begin a two-part series uh, this morning, and then you realize in three weeks we're going to have our health summit. I hope that you're planning to come to the the Health Summit and learn how to have a longer, stronger life and spiritual and physical health. And uh, we've got a great lineup for that weekend. So it's a great program to invite your friends to. The next two weeks, we're going to be talking about turning your trials into triumph. Turning your trials into triumph. You know, I like amazing facts. And the athlete that has won the most medals of any athlete in the world is Michael Phelps in many categories of swimming. I thought this was a, a very interesting picture, one of his final gold medals that he won. You can see he's kissing the medal, he's standing on the podium, and you see the tears coming to his eyes. 
as they're playing the national anthem. Uh, it's a, a pretty grueling process to get to the Olympics. First of all, anyone who makes it to the Olympics is a champion because they're there representing their country because they've already gone through incredible discipline, training, trials, tribulations before they experience the triumph of being chosen to even go to the Olympics. But to win in the Olympics is a whole nother level of training. I went online and looked at um, some statements from Michael Phelps regarding his regiment of training. By the way, he won, was it, 28 medals, 28 Olympic medals, 23 of them gold medals in all different categories of the swimming events. Becoming the most decorated Olympian ever doesn't come cheap. He's often have to grind often and harder to get there. His workouts were punishing. His body is well suited to swimming, which plays into his success, but his real secret to success is how hard he worked in the gym, in the pool, every day. His workout was intense, his diet pretty extreme, but if you're going to aim for becoming the best of the best, then you're gonna to have to push yourself further than the rest. Michael says, in preparation for Beijing, I started adding weightlifting to my dry land work. Since then, we've been expanding the amount of weights I'm using, and I'm running more than I ever have. Push-ups and pull-ups also have to be essential. For me, some of the most effective drills focus on vertical kicking and underwater kicking. Phelps said, it's painful, but very effective. It's painful. In Beijing, when my goggles filled with water, I didn't panic. Can you imagine that? You're in an Olympic race, you dive in the water and your goggles fail and they fill up with water and you're blind now and you've got to race several laps. When my goggles filled with water, I didn't panic. He says, I went back to all of my training. I knew how many strokes it would take me to get up and down the pool. So I started counting my strokes. I didn't reach the time I wanted, but I did win the race. I think sometimes we we don't know how much training is involved. They say that there's trials and tribulations of training before you can turn that into triumph. Well, God wants you to receive the gold. He wants you to walk on the golden streets and get your golden crown. And you are in training right now. And it feels like trials and tribulations. But this is par for the course. Because the Lord loves us, you're going to experience trials. They teach us to trust. I know I'm using a lot of T's here in this. I've got a friend, one of the gentlemen that uh, Pastor Ross and I, we play racquetball from time to time. And, and I remember one of our friends, known him for years, uh, played racquetball. He's a, uh, a worker, had a company, drove this company truck around. Finally, he got to where he retired. And he said, I'm going to buy a new truck. I retired, bought a new truck, thought he'd just now begin to enjoy life, and was involved in an accident. I think it may have been a head-on collision. Uh, nobody was killed, but he was banged up pretty bad, and it wrecked his truck. Brand new truck. And he was wondering, what did I do wrong? Why is this happening to me? All the pain and the loss, and he was very upset and depressed and discouraged that this should happen at this point in his life. He's still feeling sore. He figured he'd broken some ribs. The doctor said, you might want to come in and get an MRI and check on that, which he did. And in the process, the doctor called him in and said, yeah, you broke some ribs. There's no serious internal injuries. But he said, you've got a tumor on your kidney. And you need to let us do some tests. And they did some tests. And he said, it's malignant. I said, it's good that we caught this because it doesn't look like it's spread. Your other kidney is good. And the doctor said, it's a wonderful providential thing. You had this accident. You wouldn't have felt the problem until it had spread and uh, would have been too late at that point. And so he was telling us how thankful he was that he went through the trials of the truck accident and he healed from his surgery he healed from his broken ribs, and the insurance company got him a new truck. And so when you're going through a trial like that, you're wondering why. 
But, you know, if you're God's child, there's a promise, and you probably know it. In Romans chapter 8, it says in verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God allows trials, and he's usually using those trials for one of two reasons. One, God wants to do something in you. Two, God wants to do something through you. Sometimes it's both. Any trial or trouble or tribulation that you might going through, be going through, or some form of suffering, usually God is going to use it because he's doing something in you. He's teaching you. He may also be witnessing through you. You know, we do our best witnessing through trial. That's the best time to let your light shine is in the darkness. Amen? And often it's a combination of the two things that you're going through. And I know if I'm going through a hard time, sometimes we go through trials because we just haven't made good choices. And God is trying to teach us you're going through some chastening, chastening rather, and some discipline. And I've often prayed, Lord, whatever it is you're trying to teach me through this, please help me learn it so I don't have to take this class again. Amen? And uh, I think I have learned some things along the way that have saved me from unnecessary suffering. Important biblical principle, everybody is going to experience tough times. We will all experience suffer. You know, there's a wonderful story in the Bible in the book of Genesis, and you can see on the side panels the story of Joseph being reunited with his brothers. That comes from Genesis 45, and I'm going to be reading to you verses 5 through 8. After he reveals himself to his brothers, I'll start with verse 4. Genesis 45, and Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, who you sold into Egypt. But now do not be angry or grieved with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years of famine has been in the land, and there are still yet five years in which there'll be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph was saying, all that suffering that I went through, God had a plan to save much life through it. And, you know, I think knowing there's a purpose in what you suffer makes it a lot more bearable. Amen? Not only that, was God going to feed the people of Israel there, but you can read in Genesis 46, verse 3, verse 3, Jacob was apprehensive about taking everybody down to Egypt. God said, I am the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will there make you a great nation. Now, did God make a great nation for them in Egypt? Did the children of Israel have some trials in Egypt? They were being forged into a great nation through trials. They were crying out to the Lord. Why is this happening? You know, nations are rarely born without suffering. When America was born as a nation, did it experience some suffering in the process? It's often in the context of war. There is blood, sweat, tears, pain, and then you have a birth. And that's true in the political realm. It's true in the physical realm. Now, I know today they've got all kinds of things to stop the pain of childbirth, but in the good old days, before a baby came, there was often some pain and anguish. You know, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, so to speak. But uh, everyone experiences trials. I think it was Oswald Chambers who said, suffering is the heritage of the lost, in the saved, in the Son of God. Each ends in the cross. The bad thief is crucified, and he's lost. The repentant thief, he's crucified, and he's saved. The Son of God is crucified. We see the heritage of suffering is widespread. So as I'm talking about trials and suffering and tribulation in life, you might be thinking, well, I don't want to come to this church because being a Christian might involve trials you're going to have problems either way. There are troubles in life. You can't escape that. The difference is that the troubles of the lost end in tragedy, 
where the trials of the saved end in triumph. So you've just got to make up your mind. Do you want to put yourself in the hands of God so that he can orchestrate all of your trials so that you're not tempted above what you're able and he'll measure it out to you exactly what you need for your eternal good or you put your life in the hands of the devil and you'll still suffer. Uh, suffering is the lot of humanity. Job said like the sparks fly upward and there's just problems in life. Now don't get discouraged. It doesn't mean there's problems all the time. There are seasons of peace. I mean, even after Jesus' temptation says the devil left him for a season. Say amen. So it's not always like that, but you're going to have troubles. Knowing how to consider your troubles can make your life a lot happier. See, a Christian's joy is not held captive by circumstances. When you're a Christian, you can have joy regardless of the circumstances of what you might be going through. The Bible says rejoice in all things. Re rejoice forevermore. And so you can have a joy because if you understand what the purpose of trials is, you embrace them and that turns your trials into triumph. Everybody struggles. A lot of us do a good job of hiding it. St. Augustine said, God had one son on earth without sin, but he's never had a son without suffering. There's suffering for everybody. I remember hearing a story about this um, man from New York City, and he was in court in Texas, and he was suing for damages because of his medical bills in a traffic accident with this farmer and his horse trailer. And the prosecuting attorney said to the man, didn't you tell the policeman at the scene of the accident that you were fine? He said, yes, but I need to explain. And he said, no, no, you said you were fine. Did you say that? He said, yes, I did, but I need to explain. He said, no, no, you, you said you were fine. And finally the judge said, well, let him explain. And he said, well, I was driving from New York to California and going through Texas on the highway. This farmer pulling his truck out in front of me with the horse trailer, lost control, began to fishtail. He flipped over. I tried to avoid him. I flipped over and there we were all sprawled out in the road. And he said, it wasn't a policeman that showed up first. It was a Texas Ranger. The Texas Ranger went over to where the horse was suffering terribly. He pulled out his revolver and he shot the horse. Then he walked over to me and said, how are you doing? <laughs> he said, I'm fine. <laughs> he said, I don't want to end up like the horse. <laughs> and I think a lot of us often say, oh, we're just fine. How are you doing? Fine. And we're not always fine. Everybody struggles. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, these things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Jesus said you will have tribulation. But you notice he said, be of good cheer and you can have peace. So, yes, there's going to be problems in life. Tribulations, problems, it's the same thing. But you can still be cheerful, and you can still have joy, and you can still have peace in spite of the trials and the problems. God can turn them into triumphs. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. As soon as you make up your mind you want to be holy, the devil is very upset. After Jesus was baptized... The devil came after him in the wilderness. After the children of Israel went through the Red Sea, they were attacked from behind by the Amalekites. It, it's normal procedure for the devil to be threatened when you change teams. So all who desire to live godly are going to suffer persecution. Paul says in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, Paul was strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying... We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. You notice he didn't say we could or we may. He said we must, through a few, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. There are going to be a lot of challenges and problems in life. Uh, don't get discouraged by it. Look at each one as an opportunity to grow, to be more like Jesus, and to be a witness 
to others. You are training for the trophy. You're working towards the gold. It is just part of the regiment of exercise of your Christian character that you might grow. Victor E. Frankel said, A man can endure almost any suffering if he sees a purpose or a meaning in it. If you understand that God has a purpose in it, that uh, you're going to reap the benefits from it, and you've probably heard this illustration used at, at, ad nauseum, but it's a muscle, you know? And if you want to see an improvement in your strength or in your muscles, you've got to exercise. The exercise, I mean, few things are more boring than weightlifting. It really is, uh, uh, you're, not, you're not getting any work done. You just, uh, uh, but it, as you're doing that, something's happening and your body's getting stronger. And after a few days, you can stand in front of the mirror with a total shame. So look at that, a new ripple. <laughs> and, and so there's a blessing that comes, but you've got to just, uh, you've got to endure the pain for the gain, as they say in the gym. You're going to have problems in life. You are probably all experiencing various degrees of problems right now. The reason Job is a hero in the Bible is because he got hit with every possible problem all at once. But almost everybody. You've got problems in the family. There may be financial problems. You might have physical problems. Uh, there can be all kinds of different problems we grapple with. But God can use each of these in shaping you if you embrace it. Now I'm going to talk about 10 ways that we can convert our trials into triumph because this is a two-part series. I'll probably only get through half of that now. But um, first of all, recognize our spiritual need. One reason God allows trials is so that we can recognize, become aware of our spiritual needs. Second Chronicles 32 verse 31 says, God withdrew from him, King Hezekiah, in order to test him that he might know what was in his heart. Now, is, is that so God could know what was in Hezekiah's heart, or does Hezekiah, or does God know everything? God knows everything. Sometimes God uses this wording. It's like God came down to Abraham and said, I've sent two angels to Sodom to find out if what I've heard is true. Well, God knows everything. Nothing takes him by surprise. But, um, was it so God could find out what was in Hezekiah's heart or Hezekiah could find out what was in his heart? You know, if you want to discover what's in a vessel, bump it. Sometimes you got to bump something to find out what's inside. And sometimes God will have to shake us up a little bit and we discover what's going on. We didn't know. Exodus 9.27 and Pharaoh said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people are wicked. What brought Pharaoh to that confession? It was the tribulation of the plagues. He saw, he said, I and my people are wicked. He became aware of it. And he could have repented then, but he hardened his heart. But it was in the context of the trials. He finally came to the point of realizing I'm the problem. Sometimes that's what it takes. 2 Corinthians 2.14 Paul says, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ through and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. How does God diffuse that fragrance? You know, if you want to smell a flower or some herb, you don't just take it and sniff it. You can, but if you really want to smell it, you crush it. You want to know, have you ever picked mint or something in your garden? And you want to say, hey, smell this. This is great. You take a piece of that sage or that mint and you just break it or you crush it and then you can really smell it. You can't really appreciate a skunk till you run it over once or twice. Have you noticed that? <laughs> it's under those trials that they really, the fragrance comes out. Making sure you're listening. Psalm 30 verse 5, for his anger is but for a moment. His favor for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You might have some nights of mourning before you have your morning of joy, if you'll pardon the play on words there. So one thing, of course, is to recognize that God is helping us become aware of our spiritual needs, and that's a blessing. That's a good thing. We should thank Him for it. Something else is we learn humility through our trials. 
You know, we're never more like the devil than when we're proud. And sometimes God needs to humble us. Christ was meek and humble, and that's what it means to be Christ-like. And it's often in our trials we realize our pride, and the trials sometimes bring us to our knees. Deuteronomy 8.3, So he humbled you. He allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna that you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. They went through trials. They got hungry in the wilderness. They got thirsty before they could really appreciate the blessings. Someone said that um, whenever their mother was going to spank them, she'd get a switch, and he discovered that if he would hug his mother when she was spanking him, that it lessened the blow. If he drew close, you get further away, you got that centrifugal force, it hurts a lot more. And he'd, he'd just he'd pull right into his mother and hug her and she just couldn't get enough momentum to hurt very much. So, draw near the one who holds the rod and it will lessen the blow. Embrace what humbles you. If you're going through some humbling situation, if someone's got some criticism for you, take it in. Listen. Evaluate it. Say, well, thank you for that. And it's so much easier if you humble yourself and you learn from these things. Ezra 8.21 Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Avila that we might humble ourselves before our God. Matthew 26 verse 75. Remember Peter before the... Uh, the trial of Christ, he said, this night you're all going to forsake me. And Peter jumped up and said, though all these forsake you, I will not forsake you. And Jesus said, Peter, you don't know yourself very well. Before the rooster crows two times, you will deny me three times. And he needed to go through a very humbling experience of seeing Christ being beaten in the judgment hall and then looking at him. And he went out and he wept bitterly. And he realized, I, I don't know myself very well. I'm not as strong as I thought I was. When we were in uh, Australia, we're standing at the table afterward and um, we're shaking hands with all these young people that came to the AYC meeting. And this, uh, this young man wearing one of the Australian hats, oh, he may have been 16 years old, he came up and he said, can I arm wrestle you? And I thought, well, that's a strange request. And he had his buddies around him. They were all saying, oh, no, don't arm wrestle him. And I, I thought, you know, I like to engage with the kids. And so I said, all right, well, I said, wait a second. Let me feel your muscles. Come here for a second. Because the last thing you want to do is get beat by a 16-year-old, right? <laughs> so I felt his muscles. Man, they're hard as rocks. So I said, no, arm wrestle Pastor Ross. <laughs> so, but then I thought about it again. I said, okay, come on. He, he really wanted to arm wrestle me. Man. I put everything I had into trying to just keep my arm up and finally the spirit was willing but the flesh was weak and he put my <laughs> arm down. This kid was tough. And I should have known when they, when they ask you that it's because it's a setup. You know, whenever someone comes to you and says, hey, I got a bet for you, don't bet. And you know, I thought, what well, kind of hurt my pride a little bit? This kid beat me arm wrestling. I thought, well, that's probably good for you, Doug. And you got to embrace what humbles you. And the Lord is always trying to teach us through these things. Someone said, if you're on a mountain and there's lightning, it's a good idea to make yourself as small as possible. Right? I remember years ago, I was with some friends. We had a terrible freeze in California. And um, the river, the Eel River froze, which it never, it's never done it since then, but it froze all the way across. And that day I was visiting a friend who lived right on the river and a bunch of us were together. We were playing this game, all the guys, of course. And uh, we want to say, I dare you to see if you can get across the river without breaking through the ice. Well, the ice was not that thick. As a matter of fact, places it was kind of weird because it was so clear, even though it was frozen, you could see the leaves floating by underneath. So it was like glass. And um, several of the guys tried to get across the river and they'd get halfway and they'd fall through, but it would only be like up to their waist because then they'd hit the rocks and they'd come scrambling out cold and wet. We'd all laugh. And I couldn't resist the challenge. I said, I think I can make it across. 
I got down on all fours, spread my weight out, went across kind of like a crab, you know, made it to the other side. Sometimes the only way you're going to get across is you got to get on your knees. And the way to get through your trials, you got to get down. Humble yourself. Draw near to the one that holds the rod, you know, and if God's trying to teach you humility, let's get it over with as quick as possible. Another reason God allows trials, and we can turn them into triumph, is get our priorities straight. You remember the story, Genesis 22, God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son who you love, bring him to the mountains, and offer him to me. And Abraham said, oh yeah, Lord, I love you with all of my heart, my soul, my strength, but I've been waiting for a son for a long time, and I really love Isaac. You notice how God worded it? He said, take your son, your only son, who you love. Do you love him more than me? And offer him. And Abraham, as we know, passed the test. He was willing to give up the thing on earth he loved the most because he loved God more. If there's anything on earth that you love more than God, you're going to find that'll be the point of testing at some time. God is going to have to teach us to let go of it and to get our priorities right of seeking first his kingdom. You know, Jephthah went through a similar challenge. He made sort of a reckless vow. He said, Lord, give me victory in this battle. And whatever comes through my gates when I come home, he thought it was going to be his goat or sheep or his family cow that would come out to meet him. His daughter came out said, I'll offer it to you. He had one child. That was his daughter. God said, did you mean it? And he did. Now, he didn't offer as a burnt offering. He sent her to the temple, and she was dedicated to the Lord, never got married, and something like Anna in the New Testament. But it was a test to prioritize. Psalm 11, verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous. And when you're going through these trials, they often get you on your knees and it will test your prayer life. Do not make an idol of anything or anyone or it will be the source of a test. Point number four, God allows us to go through tests and you can turn your trials to triumph. They come to separate us from sin. God wants to save us from sin. And sometimes if you want to separate the dross from the gold or the silver, you've got to heat it up. And we go through these fiery trials. Peter said, do not be amazed as though some strange thing has happened unto you. That, but know that the testing of your faith is more precious than gold or silver. That though it is tried in the fire, it comes forth sparkling and pure because it's been through that trial. 1 Peter 4, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now that doesn't mean you flog yourself so you can cease from sin. But it's often true that when we realize the consequences of sin, it helps us gain the victory. And sometimes we will struggle and suffer. And it's giving us the power and the victory to prioritize that he might save us from our sins. Hebrews 12 verse 10. For they, our earthly parents, might chasten us indeed for a few days, as seemed best to them, but for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. Why do we go through chastening? That we might be partakers of His holiness, to be like Jesus. So often the trials that you go through, you may be going through trials in relationships. And you think, oh, this person is unbearable. How can I live with them anymore? And they may be a member of your family or your spouse well, the Lord loves you in spite of your sin. And he's teaching you to love. And he's teaching you to forgive. And he's teaching you to be like Jesus through the trials in the relationships. It is easy to love lovable people. Anyone can do it. It's a little more challenging to love them when they're not lovable. Amen? And so you might be going through that because he's saving you from your selfishness and your sin. You know, if you are ever in a place where you must drink water and the water is suspect to bacteria, you boil it. And that's how you get the bacteria purified. And God needs to sometimes uh, boil us, so to speak, clean us up. And then my final point this morning 
is God sometimes allows us to go through trials simply to wake us up. He's just plain old got to get our attention. And everything is cruising along and we might be living in this Laodicean self-deception and we think everything is okie-dokie and it's inky-stinky and we don't know it. We think we're rich and increased with goods and don't know that we have need of anything. We don't know that God sees us as poor, wretched, miserable, blind, naked. And we're sleeping on our way to destruction. You know the story of Peter in prison. And he was chained between two guards. Acts chapter 12. And he's going to be executed the next day. He's sleeping on his way to execution like Jonah sleeping before he's about to be thrown overboard. Sleeping through the storm. It describes many in the last days like the ten virgins asleep at that critical moment before the bridegroom comes. And God needs to wake us up. Acts 12, 7. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood by him and light shone in the prison and he struck Peter on the side. So you might be struck and you think, why did that happen? But you know, if it's an angel, it could be a strike of mercy to save you. The Bible says in the end of this chapter, the angel of the Lord struck Herod and he died. You got two different ways. Herod had turned from God. He was struck by the angel. It killed him. He was eaten by worms. Peter, on the other hand, he wanted to serve the Lord. The angel struck him in mercy to wake him up and get him out of prison to save him from his sins. Sometimes God has to do something radical to get our attention. I don't know if anyone here is old enough to remember. They used to have an advertising campaign for Menon Aftershave. And I just remember one commercial in particular where this pilot falls asleep at the controls and the plane is in a nosedive and it's heading for the ground and don't start playing yet, I'm not ready. <laughs> and and it's, it's heading for the ground and the co-pilot sees that the pilot has gone to sleep and he splashes some men in aftershave on his hands and he smacks him and he shakes himself awake and he goes, Thanks, I needed that. <laughs> Anyone remember that? Yeah, a couple of people, yeah. My friends and I saw that. We went around smacking each other. And then you were supposed to say, thanks, I needed that. <laughs> we thought it was great to wake us up. And sometimes we need to say, Lord, thanks. I needed that. To get our attention, he wants to wake us up to save us. You know, it's a story that has been told many times and I think uh, it bears repeating. Uh, I'll add something that most people don't know. There's a hymn that we're about to sing in closing and it's called, It Is Well With My Soul. Now that was written by Horatio Gates Spafford and he wrote it in about 1873. Now here's the story behind that. Uh, Spafford was an attorney, worked in Chicago, dedicated Christian, elder in the church, taught Sunday school, good friends with D.L. Moody, the famous evangelist. He was very successful, owned a lot of property around Chicago. But then in 1871, the Chicago fire swept through the city, destroyed a great swath of the city. I think 300 people perished in the fire and it wiped out most of his properties. In spite of that, he and his wife Anna gave a lot of what they had left to help those who were suffering from the fire. Well, then there was a stock market crash in 1873 that took him down even further. He thought, well, you know, we need to uh, try and get a new beginning. Dwight Moody and Iris Sankey were in England doing an evangelistic program and um, Horatio was friends of Moody and he told his wife, he said, let's go join them we need to maybe uh, take a little vacation for our nerves. We've been through a lot. Uh, and um, so he sent his wife and his four daughters on ahead of him on a ship because he had to tie up some loose ends with real estate. And he said, I will meet you there in England. On the way over in 1873, the ship that they were on out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, not too far from where the Titanic was struck, was hit by an iron sailboat from Scotland that pretty much cut their ship in half. And 226 of the passengers on this ship called the Villiers de Harvey, 
was the vessel they were on, died. Uh, right after the collision, Anna gathered her children from their births, brought them up on deck, knelt and prayed with them that they might have peace with God. They all fully expected to die. A, a lifeboat was put down from the other ship and in rowing by the wreck, they saw that there was a woman unconscious on a plank and it turned out to be Anna. She was brought back to England and they had telegraphed back then. She telegraphed back to her husband, eventually saved alone. Uh, all of his daughters were lost and she wanted to know what to do. He said, stay there. He got on a ship as quickly as he could, was crossing the ocean and right about the point where they were crossing where his family and the other boat had gone down, the captain said, just as a point of interest, this is the spot where the collision took place. And uh, he went up on the deck, he said a prayer, then he went down to his room and he penned the poem that are the words in the song we're about to sing. It is well with my soul, though peace like a river attends my way, though sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. He got to England, was reunited with his wife, Anna. Uh, they joined the Moody's, came to comfort them and said that they were encouraged by their faith. They said, this is all in God's hands. God knows what he's doing. We don't understand it. We trust him and we will understand some way. They had three more children together. They had a little boy named Horatio who died of scarlet fever. And then Horatio and his wife they went through an interesting change. They became very obsessed with the second coming. I guess you could say they were Adventist. They became part of a Messianic group. They moved to Israel. They stopped believing in an ever-burning hell. And they started a group in Jerusalem called the American Council. And it was something like a kibbutz, a commune, and Christians came and they said they were going to minister to Christians, to Jews, to Muslims, and they gained international trust in that city for being just loving Christian people that anybody could turn to. Well, Horatio died of malaria there. Uh, the group continued for some time. Eventually, the building that they used, or their, their quarters was uh, remodeled, they turned it into a hotel and that hotel is where the peace accords were signed between the uh, Israel and the Arab nations. It's a very interesting story. You're not going to find in your hymnal another song by Horatio Spafford. As far as I know it's the only song he ever wrote. He didn't really write it as a song, he wrote it as a poem. Uh, Later, when he showed the poem to Ira Sankey and P.P. Bliss, Bliss said, let me write some music for that. Now, Philip Bliss, if you look in your hymnal, he's got, hold the fort, almost persuaded, hallelujah, what a savior, let the lower lights be burning, wonderful words of life. And he wrote with um, Horatio, it is well with my soul. Later, P.P. Bliss was in a train accident with his wife he escaped, but she could not get out. The train caught on fire and he went back and stayed at his wife's side and died with her in the flames. He would not leave her. Seems like uh, tragedies and you think, why do these trials and these tragedies happen? You know, if you have your life in God's hands, whatever happens circumstantially, it cannot rob your joy. It can still be well with your soul. You know, he only wrote this one song but that song has been sung by millions. You go online, go to YouTube, see how many people have recorded this song. It was inspired. And God wants us to know that whatever you might be going through, is it well with your soul? Whatever your trials are, Peter says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. God wants to turn your trials into an ultimate triumph. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to sing it together. And so I'd like to invite you to stand our... Uh, singers will come out and let's sing this familiar hymn.